There was a time when all the light in people's homes depended on these and the people who made them. I want to take you back to the year 1888, to deepest, poorest East London, the same year and location as Jack the Ripper. But instead of a story of women helplessly murdered in dark alleyways, I have a story of how ordinary women got together and helped to win you the employment rights you take for granted today. I'm Luke Pierce, and this is the Radical History Channel, where we present the stories of the incredible individuals who fought for democratic and social freedoms through the ages. Today is the turn of the Match Girls and their strike. Since the 1850s, two Quakers, William Bryant and Francis May, had run a factory making matches in Bow in East London. That's a factory making matches, by the way, not a matchmaking factory, which it sounds like some depraved future version of Tinder. Bryant and May's factory employed thousands of people, most of whom were women and girls, and the work of making and packing matches was split between the factory and workers' houses. This allowed Bryant and May to sneakily get around some of the regulations of the Factory Acts, which had been brought in to regulate the length of the working day for most people working in factories. Factories. Bryant and May's employees were typically working 12 hour days or more. Matches were made by dipping two ends of a stick of poplar wood into white phosphorus, and these strike anywhere matches could be lit on most hard surfaces. The downside of white phosphorus was that it caused workers' skin to yellow, hair loss, and a condition called fossy jaw, which was a particularly nasty form of bone cancer where the jawbone rotted. The disease spread to the brain and could cause a painful death. Red phosphorus, a safer alternative which is used on modern matchboxes, had been discovered in the mid-19th century, but it was quite a bit more expensive, so Bryant and May dropped that idea and allowed their workers to suffer. As well as facing long hours and health hazards, unskilled match workers were paid low wages. Worst of all, the factory's foremen enforced a system of fines. If you were late for work, were caught talking, dropped matches, or bizarrely had dirty feet, then you'd have money deducted from your pay. The dirty feet thing feels particularly unfair given that workers could barely afford shoes, and seriously, after a day walking around my place, you should see the state of my feet. Still, the women needed to work. This was not a time of great education, healthcare, or savings, all of which help you switch jobs today if you're in one you don't like. So when the British government proposed a tax on matches in 1871, many match workers went on strike and marched to Parliament to present a petition in support of their employers. The police tried to block them along the way, but the strikers won the support of Queen Victoria and the newspapers, and the next day the government dropped the tax. Annie Besant was a middle-class socialist and activist who published a newspaper called The Link, campaigning against sweatshop and child labour, extortionate landlords, and unhealthy workplaces. After hearing about the Match Girl's poor pay at a meeting of the Fabian Society in 1888, Besant wrote an article titled White Slavery in London, exposing their situation. Bryant and May didn't like this bad publicity at all, and workers at the factory were asked to sign a statement contradicting the Link article. When some workers refused to sign, at least one woman was sacked. Amazingly, in an immediate act of solidarity, 1,400 women from the Bryant and May factory went out on strike. Fearful of the bad publicity, management offered to reinstate the sacked worker, but now the match girls wanted more, and they went to ask Annie Besant for organisational support and leadership. The women created a Match Girls Union with Besant as their leader. Besant organised a strike fund for the women through her newspaper, and many sympathisers contributed, including the London Trades Council, who normally only supported skilled workers. Besant also took some of the women to meet MPs in Parliament. Not everyone was supportive, though. The Times newspaper, for example. The Match Girls have not been suffered to take their own course, but have been egged on to strike by irresponsible advisers. No efforts have been spared by those pests of the modern industrialised world to bring this quarrel to a head. But as well as Annie Besant, another woman who would later become an international celebrity started supporting the Match Girls. Emmeline Pankhurst, later of suffragette fame, wrote in her autobiography about how she threw herself into the strike with enthusiasm. It was a time of tremendous unrest, of labour agitations, of strikes and lockouts. It was a time also when a most stupid reactionary spirit seemed to take possession of the government and the authorities. This is an interesting example of how apparently different campaigns can overlap in history. Emmeline Pankhurst was about 30 years old at the time, and I I suppose just learning how to campaign with these striking women in East London, many years before her victorious campaigning for women to get the vote with the suffragettes. If you're enjoying this video, please take a moment to click the like button, give me a thumbs up below, and while you're at it, you might want to subscribe to the channel too. It's the big red button below.
Anyway, within weeks of going on strike, the Match Girls had a result. In a meeting with the Bryanton May management, they demanded an end to the fine system and the ability to eat meals in a separate room away from the chemicals they were working with. The management agreed to these demands and the strike came to an end. The workers still had to deal with white phosphorus, but the good news was that the Salvation Army decided to set up a rival factory to Bryanton Mays with better conditions for match workers. Eventually, the British government signed up to the 1906 Berne Convention, banning white phosphorus in the manufacture of matches. Now just think what a step this strike was. These women, already living in poverty, had to risk permanent unemployment to go on strike, and there was no guarantee that their sacrifices would achieve anything. Before the strike, they were considered to be unskilled workers who passively accepted their fate in life but no longer. The strike showed up incredible solidarity between the women and was an inspiration for the formation of other labour unions for unskilled workers. In fact, the Match Girls' actions heralded a phenomenon in international history known as the rise of new unionism. So the Match Girls realised that they could achieve more together than they could alone. And that was the moment of ignition, if you'll forgive me the pun, for the fire of change that was to come in the 20th century. I hope you enjoyed this video about the Match Girls strike in London in 1888. It gives you something else to think about, doesn't it? Beyond just Sherlock Holmes and Jack the Ripper, which we normally associate with this period in history. If you enjoyed the video, then please consider subscribing to the Radical History YouTube channel, which you can do by clicking the red subscribe button below this video. While you're at it, you might also want to give me a thumbs up. This helps other people to discover the content that we're producing here on the Radical History channel. Until next time, keep reading and learning about radical history, and I'll see you then.